from the Caspian Sea in the west to China and Mongolia in the east and from Afghanistan and Iran in the south to Russia in the north lies a region of the world known as Central Asia. This region, characterized by high passes and mountains, vast deserts, and the iconic treeless grassy steppes, is home to the former Soviet republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Other than being known as the land of the Stans, horse archers, nomadic civilizations, the homeland of the Turks, the region is well known to be a predominantly Islamic one, but that was not always the case. Tengerism is a Central Asian religion characterized by shamanism, animism, totism, and monotheism, and most importantly, ancestor worship. It was the prevailing religion of the Turks, Mongols, Hungarians, Bulgars, Xiongnu, and even possibly the Huns. And it was a state religion for several medieval states, such as the Gokturk Khaganate, the Western Turkic Khaganate, the Old Great Bulgaria, the Danube Bulgaria, Volga Bulgaria, and Eastern Turkia, also known as Khazaria. Until the Battle of Talas in 751, which was a very decisive battle fought between the Abbasid Caliphate and the Tang Dynasty over the future of Central Asia, Islam did not really take off in Central Asia. There were a few converts here and there who converted for a variety of reasons. And this video aims to explore the similarities uh, conceptually between uh, Tengrianism and Islam may have played a role for uh, converts to convert to Islam in the first place. So. Let's get right into it. In Tengrinism, Tengris view their existence as sustained by the eternal blue sky, known as Tengri, the fertile mother earth spirit, AJ, and a ruler regarded as the holy spirit of the sky, heaven, earth, and spirits of nature and ancestors provide for every need and protect all humans. By living an upright, respectful life, a human will keep his world in balance and perfect his personal wind horse or spirit. There is a celestial world and an underground world in Tengerism. The only connection between these realms is the tree of the worlds, which is the center of the world, aka the realm in which we exist in. The ce celestial and subterranean worlds are divided into several layers, 9 in the underworld and 17 and in the celestial world. And shamans can recognize the entries of these realms and travel to them. In other words, these realms are par like parallel universes. They have their own respected souls and shamans and natural spirits. Sometimes these beings visit earth but are invisible to people and they manifest themselves only in strange sizzling fire or bark to the shaman. Both Tengenism and Islam share a lot of conceptual similarities, especially when it comes to uh, things that are basically unseen. I already discussed Tengenism has a celestial realm, the realm of the trees, or the world tree, and the realm um, of the underworld, or the subterraneous realm. In Islam, there is something similar. Uh, there is heaven, which is Jannah. There is, of course, the world we reside in, which is the Dunya. And finally, there is the world uh, of hell, which is Jahannam. Both Tengrinism and Islam have layers in the uh, in Jannah and celestial realm, and in Jahannam and in the subterraneous underworld realm. In both religions, both of the realms are layered based on how well one uh, adheres to the religion itself. In Tengrinism, the more you follow the way of the ancestors and live a respectable life, the brighter the, the higher realms will be when you transcend. However, um, if you do the opposite, uh, you go into darker and darker layers of the subterraneous realm, where things are dark and chaotic and quite opposite to the celestial realm. The same can be said in Islam. 
Jannah has eight gates, and in Jannah, each gate uh, is determined by how much of the basic duties of a Muslim uh, Muslim commits to. So, with the first gate of Jannah uh, being one regarding Salah, or the f- or the fact that Muslims have to commit uh, to doing daily prayers every single day. Um, with the greatest uh, gate, the eighth gate, the final gate being that of uh, dhikr, uh, the act of remembering Allah at all times in your heart and in your mind. The same can be said regarding um, Jahannam. Jahannam has seven layers, and in Jahannam, depending on how much of a disbeliever you were and how much sin you have committed according to Islamic doctrine, you'll be placed at a certain level, with the first level of hell being the, w- the least uh, p- uh, painful, with the final layer of hell uh, being the most painful. And that's reserved for people who have committed egregious sin against uh, Allah, Muslims, and other peoples. Another similarity between Islam and Tangrianism is the fact that both religions admit to the fact that there are other beings than human beings. In Tangrianism, that might be the replicated spirits found in other realms, and obviously the uh, the shamans and the humans that reside in those realms. In Islam, um, we have angels who reside in Jannah and fulfill Allah's every command, and they tend to have no free will. And then there's the shaitan, who are the fallen angels who reside in Jahannam, whose aim is to distract mankind uh, from the the true path of Islam and lead them to hell, Jahannam. There's another uh, set of beings that the Quran admits their existence to and that is the jinn. Now the jinn, uh, just like human beings, have free will, emotions and are essentially identical except for the fact that humans cannot see them. Jinn also have supernatural abilities and powers and have the uh, free reign in the human realm and interfere in human affairs. As a result, there are good jinns and bad jinns. Good jinns generally being those who accepted the message of Islam since the Prophet Muhammad was the messenger not only to mankind but also to the jinn. There are also the possibility of uh, jinns who have converted to Judaism and Christianity. However, their status is ambiguous. So the jinns um, may be akin to the spirits, the natural spirits that reside in um, in the Tangrius worldview. Finally, last but not least, the most significant and crucially important uh, similarity between Islam and Tangrianism is the fact that they both have monotheistic features or are monotheistic by default. In Tangrianism, um, the main deity the main god that everyone worships is Tengri himself. As a result, uh, this, um, the most of the worship goes directly towards Tengri, who is not very much associated with any other deity around, and is, pro- and is the supreme deity, who is also the ruler of the skies. Although uh, there are some polytheistic features within uh, Tengrianism, uh, that being uh, related to specific aspects of human life, for example, Ume, the goddess of fertility and virginity, and Erlich Khan, who is the god of death. Nonetheless, majority of Tengrius just worship Tengri. And this uh, fact that Tengri is basically worshipped separate from any other deity and that they have no relation to Tengri himself creates this very unique parallel which fulfills the idea of Tawhid in Islam. Uh, which is a very fundamental and crucially important concept in the religion. Uh, Tawhid means literally unification or asserting oneness. And it comes from the Arabic word wahada, which means uh, itself to unite, unify, or consolidate. However, when this term, I- this term is used, it is usually used in reference to Allah himself. It means it is realizing and maintaining Allah's unity in all of man's action, which is directly or indirectly related to him. It is a belief that Allah is one, without partner and his dominion and has actions, one without similitude in his essence and attributes, and one without rivalry in his divinity and in worship. And these three basic aspects is what categorizes and defines Tawheed. 
in a way a shamanist at the time may have seen uh, Allah as Tengri or Allah as a description of Tengri and it could be seen as vice versa from Muslims trying to understand Tengriists during their time. In fact, we can get some insight of this kind of interaction from an interview that was taken 10 years ago from the making of this video. Uh, an interview with um, Professor Oras Shapashev, who is an ethnic uh, Kazakh from Altai, Kazakhstan, and is a scholar of Central Eurasian Turkic languages and culture. And in this interview, he shed some light regarding the relationship between shamanism and Islam. When he, when he was asked about how uh, shamanism and Islam was intertwined, he had basically said this. Our Turks have accepted Islam easily, without resistance. In Islam, the image of Allah is one. He is invisible. He is the one. He is accepted as Tengri, or the one who lives in the sky. This image is beautiful. These two images of Tengri and Allah found compatibility. They intertwined into one. Up to this day, our people call Tengrim Jargasun, we say, for instance, which means uh, Allah give us health. Instead of Allah, we say Tengri, but we are Muslims. The explanation given by Professor Shabashev is a testimony of the compatibility between the ideas of Tengri and Allah. However, it is important to note that the similarities between Tengrinism and Islam and there in the conceptual realm. Differences between Tengrinism and Islam do show up when it comes in, comes in terms of practice. And this is the case because uh, Islam, on the one hand, is, ba is a, based on a written corpus in which the rules are written and religious doctrines are determined by the Quran and then explained through Hadith. Tengrinism does not work this way. Rather, Tengrinism relies on personal experiences and personal relation to spirits in order to guide them in their life. Things that are basically uh, not documentable. And as a result, there is no doctrine and there is no specific rules guiding person who follows Tengrinism. As a result, these two belief systems are fundamentally different. Nonetheless, people still converted to Islam before the Battle of Talas, even if the conversion rates and the amount of Muslims that did convert were pretty small compared to the rest of the population of Central Asia. Therefore, one wonders on what factors may have influenced uh, people to convert to Islam other than the conceptual similarities between their religions, in, in this case between Tengarism and Islam. Therefore, uh, we must look into the history of um, Central Asia in regards to how Islam spread there in the first place and what motivated people to change their religion. Prior to the introduction of Islam, there were a lot of different religions that existed in Central Asia. In the Oasis Belt region, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, and Mankism was dominant. There were also Nestorian Christian communities found in several cities, such as Merv and Samarkand at the time, and there was also a significant Jewish population in between the Samarkand Bukhara area. In the southwest, near modern day Turkmenistan, there were traces of the Hellenistic cult, the same cult that was followed during the time of Alexander the Great. The steppes and the deserts were inhabited by the Turkic speaking nomadic pastoralists, essentially the Tengrists. Islam was brought to the region by the Arab armies that invaded Khorasan and Transoxia in the mid 7th century. And in 705, um, Khuthayba ibn Muslim became the governor of Khorasan, who established his principal seat at Merv. It was until his death in 714 that he repeatedly undertook campaigns eastwards into the Fergana Valley and beyond in order to spread Islam and the realm of the Umayyad Caliphate. We can gain insight on the contemporary attitudes towards Islam during this time from the works of um, Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Jafar Nakshakhi, he, who was a Songdian scholar from the village of Narshak in the Bukhara oasis, and he is the first known historian of Central Asia. His book, 
um, the history of Bukhara uh, was written in Arabic and was presented to the Samanid Emperor Nuh the first either in 943 or 941 and this book provides important information on Bukhara that cannot be found in contemporary sources and it is through this source in which we can see uh, what Qutayba ibn Muslim had done in order to uh, ha allow Islam to have a hold in Central Asia. It was narrated that the, the Umayyad Caliphate had sent armies raiding uh, the region uh, in, during uh, the winters and they returning back in the summers. And during those times they had forcefully converted the inhabitants to Islam. And every time they left, the inhabitants uh, apostated and then returned back to their original religions. And the thing is, that the opposition towards is, uh, Islam in Samarkand and in Bukhara and many other parts of Central Asia was so violent that no Muslim was safe in the mosques and, and that during prayer, during times where they, Muslims had to be in public places, they were always armed. And the leadership had appointed spies in order to spy on new converts in order to make sure that they weren't threat to other Muslims. Qutayba ibn Muslim had um, forced the inhabitants of um, of the cities he conquered and the areas administrated by the Umayyad Caliphate to convert to Islam but in the following ways by making it easier and giving incentives for people to convert to Islam at least materialistically uh, through the means of providing rewards of money for those who would attend the Friday prayer in the mosque and they were and that were non Muslims and also to allow the Quran to be recited in Persian instead of Arabic uh, he, and he had made it very hard to follow the previous religion that existed uh, in the city. He had done so by destroying all idols, all kinds of imagery and the worship places, converted the worship places into the mosque and just made it very hard to follow the old religion. Additionally, uh, Qutayba ibn Muslim created societal pressure as a means to convert um, the, in the inhabitants of Bukhara to Islam by suggesting and ordering the people of Bukhara to give one half of their homes to the Arabs so that the Arabs might be with them and, inf and inform them of their sentiments. And this would oblige them to be Muslim, according to Narshahi. All of these proactive actions by Qutayba ibn Muslim is interesting considering the fact that the Quran states regarding the question of conversion that there is no compulsion in religion. And rather, that one must uh, convert somebody by convincing their hearts and minds rather than forcing them to do so. So perhaps there was a more pragmatic reason to why Qutayba ibn Muslim was so proactive and so concerned about the fact that the uh, inhabitants of Bukhara were not Muslim. And that's probably because of the fact that they were not of the people of the book. The Quran mentions the people of the book, them being Jew Jews, Christians, and to a certain extent in certain interpretations, Zoroastrians, to be the people of the book. Those people have the right to maintain their religion as long as they pay the jizya tax, which gives them the right to um, maintain and keep their religion. And since the population of Bukhara, uh, or at least the majority of it, was not of any of the people of the, of the book, Qutayba ibn Muslim felt that it was necessary to convert to Islam from a more sec national security point of view than maybe a religious one. As Central Asia and the region of Khorasan, Bukhara and Samarkand were at the fringes of the empire. And having dissident and non-conformist forces at the border may pose as a security threat for the rest of the empire. And therefore it was important to consolidate power in the region or at least have everyone assimilate to one culture or one religion. Due to the fact that uh, Islam came through to Central Asia via conquest instead of uh, missionary work, it is important to note that it's very likely that the many uh, prisoners of war and prisoners taken uh, during the conquest were converted to Islam through the means of slavery, as the prisoners of war would be made into slaves who would be sold into the domestic markets across the empire and eventually would learn Arabic and Islam in the households that they were part of and they would eventually be free and therefore uh, slavery became the main means of conversion but there were still a lot of people who converted voluntarily as well
historians Malice Radovan and Azim Nanje in their book The Historical Atlas of Islam uh, give explain to us some of the reasons why people at the time would have converted to Islam separating their factors based on whether those reasons were spiritual or whether the reasons are more materialistic regarding the spiritual ones or the ones regarding religion conceptual similarities between the original religion of the convert and islam may have been a motivating factor for conversion and that islam potentially might be uh, the cure or even the solution to certain problems found within the original religion of the convert and therefore they would convert to islam and this is usually complemented uh, by a secular and more materialistic uh, factors which I'll get into soon. The other uh, religious reason is the fact that the process of conversion is quite simple in Islam unlike other mysterious re religions that surrounded Islam during its early days. And all that needs to be done was for the uh, convert to in front of witnesses to recite the Shahada, which is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, which means there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. And thus this would be more enticing and more convenient and might be uh, a reason for, con uh, for people to convert to Islam in the first place during the time. The materialistic reason uh, of that the historians discuss generally revolves around social ambition. And this makes a lot of sense considering how the Umayyad society was at the time. So ever since the beginning of the Arab conquest, the relationship within the Umayyad Caliphate was one between the conqueror and conquered. The Arabs being the conquerors and everyone else being the conquered. And at least for the first century of the Caliphate, uh, there was a very uh, apartheid-like uh, system in which uh, the Arabs had absolute dominance over society and uh, they also had the f feeling of religious moral high ground of them being the more original Muslims and them being the more Muslim Muslims compared to those who have been converted and obviously compared to the non-Muslims uh, at the time. And in order to maintain their lands, the elites of the previous regime converted to Islam in order to reduce their losses. And this was definitely the case when the conquest of the Sasanian Empire uh, finished, where soldiers, officials and landlords made common cause with the conquerors and had accepted Islam. Uh, additionally, a entire societal change and assimilations uh, to Islam took place in the means of supporting the Arab garrisons in the cities and towns and villages uh, across the empire. Because as the conquest happened, the way how the Arabs consolidated their powers, have, their gar have them, their armies build a garrison in the city and then base the entire city structure around that, that Arab garrison. And therefore, if you wanted to find good employment in this new Islamic regime, being a convert gave you a lot much higher chances than just being a non-Muslim. Finally, the cities that were developing in Iraq and Iran, them also uh, being the houses in which the knowledge of the law and traditions of the prophets were explored, but at the same time secular learning in the fields such as literature, astronomy, philosophy, medicine and mathematics came to rise, became a distinction amongst the patrician class. And hence, uh, leading to the point in which uh, the Islamic world reaches status as one of the most developed and sophisticated societies at the time outside of China. To see this urban model and to see the kind of people it produces in its way would have uh, exercised their own appeal and the people of the fringes of the of the core lands and the core regions would have encountered Islam in various numerous guises from educated literate merchants, wandering scholar teachers, charismatic dervishes, native princes with impressive retinues sophisticated intellectuals and missionaries who had the very good ability of tailoring the message of Islam to meet and suit the audiences of various different and varied cultural backgrounds. In its own way, through the example of the individual and the way they carried themselves would have inspired certain individuals to convert to Islam.
the conceptual similarities between Tengrianism and Islam would have just made it easier for Tengris to convert to Islam, in my humble opinion. Reasons for them to reach that point would be because of societal factors, materialistic factors, place. whether it be them to achieve better living standards, whether it be to improve and push on their social ambitions, whether it be for uh, better rights as human beings. Uh, it's all defined and determined by how well the person stands in the society they're in under the Umayyad Caliphate and then later Abbasid Caliphate. And, and all this was into consideration due to the fact that there was a lot of religions uh, already existing there. And so the competition was fierce in terms of uh, getting converts to different religions, lest we forget that the Tang Dynasty had control of Central Asia and through their soft power prevented Islam from uh, spreading since uh, Islam is not only a religious uh, entity at the time but also a political one. In the end, all what I speak of, at least in comparing and contrasting the similarities between Tangrianism and Islam, is all in the realm of speculation. The only person who truly knows why a person converted from one religion to another is themselves and perhaps even God, if you believe in him. And therefore, what I've done here is just a thought experiment to see what kind of conclusions one can reach when they compare and contrast two things that would usually not be put into the same sentence in most parts of the world. And perhaps even bring light into the histories and traditions that existed in certain parts of the world that still exist today and which is currently going through a revival. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you consider subscribing. This is the first time I made such kind of content and I hope to do a lot more. And I'll be covering various kinds of interesting topics, probably delving into history, but also other topics in, at the same time. So thank you very much and I hope you tune in next time.